Good morning, everybody. It is nice to see everybody once again on this first of the week. It's a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we've got a couple of prayers. Go on to Shirley. She is traveling up to Nelspreet for a few weeks. She's going to go see on the other half notes. And then we've got Auntie Sally, she's not feeling well, so she's not coming through today. 29th of October, Bible study for the teens. Okay. And then, warm welcome to Chris and Alana from Port Elizabeth, Pickering Street. It is nice to have you with us. Uh, I hear you've moved down now, so... I'm assuming we're going to see a lot more of you. <laughs> okay, great. All right, then we've got... What have we got? We've got a birthday coming up on the 18th. Today's the 15th, so that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay, Uncle Robin in Central. We've got Daniel coming up the 24th. <clears throat> Christine's birthday has changed to December, and Tony Stephanie the 30th of October. Alright. Wedding anniversary has also changed to December. 25th. 25th of December. Yes, All right. Greek name day, so, you know, I'll just, it's easy <laughs> to remember. <laughs> so this is just a placeholder for December. Alright, any other announcements? Leroy is uh, gallivanting all over the show. Sunday school next week. Alright, any other announcements? Are there other, no other announcements? Okay, if there are no other announcements, let us open this morning with a word of prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you again, so the, again this morning, grateful for the blessings that you have given to us in the week that has gone past, Father. And Lord is always looking forward to the good things that you will bestow on us in the week that lies before us. We are grateful for this opportunity that we have once again of being able to assemble here this morning. Father, of being able to gather together as brothers and sisters in your name, Father. That we can come before you, Lord, and worship you. All honor and glory goes to you, Father, because of who you are, Lord, the creator of all things. Father, we think of those amongst a number that are sick. Father, for those that are not feeling well, we think of Esmeralda, we also think of Auntie Sally. We think of Leroy traveling overseas, and we also think of Auntie Shirley that will be traveling Father. We ask you to be with them, Father, and to give them traveling mercies. Lord, we're also grateful for Chris and Alana that are with us here this morning, Father, taking the time. They have moved down from Pickering Street, Father, and we look forward to seeing them often here as we assemble together. And Father, as we go into our worship this morning, we ask that, that you will guide us in everything that we do, that our worship to you may be acceptable in your sight. And Father, we ask your blessing upon each one, and this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. There is sunshine in my soul today.
This morning we read from John chapter 10, verse 7 to 11. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This morning, just when I was just a, a small, not a very in-depth look, but just a quick look at the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. Of course, we are the sheep as we know. We refer to God. Psalm 23 is probably one of the most known psalms David ever composed. And I'm sure you, all of us probably know it off by heart. But there are so many great lessons contained in Psalm 23 that we could study and analyze and continue to find new truths and powerful messages each time we study. The psalm as David begins by declaring, there is nothing he lacks since the Lord is his shepherd. David says, he lets me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters. Recall that David was a shepherd before he became king of Israel. Therefore David is speaking from first hand experience. He knows sheep, he knows what is their requirements, he knows what he must provide to them for his sheep, to listen to him, to follow him. There are a couple of a couple of things that the shepherd needs to provide to his sheep in order for them to follow, to listen, and to be obedient. And owing to their timidity, they refuse to lie down unless they are free from all fear. A flock of sheep will not lie down unless they are free from friction within each other. If tormented by flies or parasites, sheep will not lie down. Sheep will not lie down as long as they feel in need of finding food. David says in verse 3, He restores my soul. To understand what David means by this, let us again hear the words of a shepherd. A heavy, fat, or long fleeced sheep will not lie down comfortably, will lie down comfortably in a little hollow or depression in the ground. It may roll slightly on its side and stretch out its legs. Sorry, that. Suddenly, the center of gravity in the body shifts, and so that the, the, the sheep basically ends up lying on its back. Now the sheep falls because if left in such a position, it's, it's surely going to die. The shepherd must come and restore the sheep before he dies. This image brings great clarity to what David says the Lord is doing for his sheep. God puts us back on our feet. God is there to pick us up when we fall over. The image is extremely accurate to what happens to us in our lives. When we try to fix our own problems, we frequently create worse problems. In our efforts to get back on our feet, we usually are turning ourselves over to a more precarious position. We need the Lord to set us on our feet. How often we are like these sheep spiritually. We are spiritually on our backs and we are helpless. But our Lord has come to us in our lost spiritual condition and set us back on our feet through His mercy and grace found in the blood of Jesus. God can restore us when we have fallen down. Our, most, our merciful Lord receives us back when we cry out to Him for help. I just want to repeat the verse 11 from John 10 again. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Shall we pray for the bread? <coughs> Lord God, as we
we approach your throne this morning, Lord, we, we are so grateful, grateful for the bread. The bread which symbolizes the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Shepherd, who laid down his life for sinners like us, undeserving sinners like us. Yet, Lord, he did it because of the love you have for us. We are so blessed and we are so indebted, Lord, that we can never pay you back. And that's, that's the, the good thing, we don't expect this to. So Lord, may this gratitude that we have because of what happened on the cross, may this gratitude grow in our hearts. May the cross be rooted in our heart and our love for our Savior just grow and grow. Lord, as we, as we pray, pray this morning, we ask that you shall bless each one of us. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. symbolizing the blood of your Son. Lord, we ask that you shall bless each one of us and that we shall remember that this represents the new covenant which you established. Also, that our sins has been washed away by the blood of the Lamb, the sacrificial Lamb offering himself for us. Once again, we thank you for this gift, the greatest gift of all, blessing us with the blood of Christ. We pray in your name.
come this morning to a fascinating portion of scripture. And if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 20 to 35. And this is a story within a story. And so we're going to be splitting up into two weeks. It is a very important portion of scripture that Mark blends together in a very unique way. In verse 21, his family calls him a lunatic. <clears throat> And when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his senses. In verse 22, the scribes and the Pharisees say he is possessed by Beelzebub, and they call him a liar, because he claims to be God, but in fact, he is from Satan. On the other hand, we have the testimony of the Holy Spirit in verse 29, that He is Lord of all. So those are the three options. Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or He is Lord. Those are your three options. The New Testament is written clearly to make it clear and obvious to any reader that Jesus is not a lunatic. Lunatics don't heal sick people. They do not raise dead people. They do not drive out demons. Lunatics do not speak the way Jesus spoke, or thought the way that Jesus thought. Lunatics do not act the way that he acted. Lunatics don't attract women and children. Lunatics are not marked by kindness, compassion, and mercy. Nor is Jesus a liar, nor is he perhaps the cleverest of all deceivers, because liars again can't raise dead people. Frauds don't heal sick people, don't banish disease from an entire nation for a duration of three years. Frauds don't dominate the dynamic world either, and neither do frauds die and having been buried rise again from the grave. So we are really left with only one option with regard to Jesus. Unless you want to join the ranks of those who think he is a lunatic, or join the ranks of those who think he is the greatest liar of all time, there is only one option then left, and that he is who he claimed to be, and that he is indeed God. And the evidence for this is overwhelming. The virgin birth, his sinless life, power over the physical world, power over the spiritual world, power over life, power over death, power over creation. We have one option. Clearly, He is Lord. In order to make this abundantly clear, the Holy Spirit ordained that there would be four Gospels written for the purpose of declaring the deity of Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. All four writers 
and the same purpose. They write so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is God, and that believing you might have life in His name. But the reason you want to get the right view of Christ is because it is the only path to salvation. Otherwise, you die and you go and suffer in hell for all eternity. So Mark basically has the same purpose that John has in 2031. He says that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he tips it again as his purpose in Mark 1, 1 when he says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I'm going to tell you about the one, says John, or says Mark, who is the Son of God. We are at the end of chapter 3 in our lesson in Mark. And let us look at our first option this morning, and that is he is a lunatic. He is a lunatic. That's a possibility. That is a possibility. I don't think I've ever seen a lunatic say that he is Buddha. I've never heard of a lunatic claiming to be Muhammad or Baal or some other god. But for some other strange reason, they all want to be Jesus. And that is not too hard to figure out why. Because it is the one name that Satan wants to corrupt. Maybe Jesus was, I don't know, like Charles Manson, a lunatic. That is a possibility. The reason he thinks he is God is because he can't think. Like the guy in the mental institution lying in a bed and he says, I'm Napoleon, I'm Napoleon, I'm Napoleon. And the guy lying in the bed next to him says, who's told you that? And he says, God did. And the guy replies, oh no I didn't. Now we understand this kind of non-thinking. Was Jesus on the same level as a guy who thinks he's a poached egg? A guy who is irrational? Not hardly. Not by any stretch of the imagination. His mind was pure. It was perfect. His reasoning was the most profound. No one ever spoke like he spoke. No one ever heard anything from anybody ever the way they heard the things from him. But of all things, his family thinks he's a lunatic. Verse 20. It says he came home. Literally, he came to a house. Now, this is not to say that Jesus went back to Nazareth. Because we know that Jesus has made his headquarters in Capernaum. So what about the house? Exactly which one we do not know. There has been one house mentioned in Mark 1.29, and that is Peter's house. Perhaps again it is Peter's house that is a focal point in this message. Perhaps it is Peter's house where the roof was dismantled in chapter 2 and the paralytic was let down. But what is certain is we don't know for sure which house it is. But he comes to a house and again the crowd is gathered there. They are the crowd is relentless now. They can't get enough of the miracles that Jesus is doing. They can't get enough of the entertainment from these miracles. They can't get enough of the benefit.
from these miracles that Jesus performs. They come if they are sick. They come if they are possessed. They come with family members and friends who are or have these issues. They want healing and they want deliverance. And they know that Jesus has the power to do it. There is nothing like it. Or there has nothing been like it since Jesus came to earth. Rabbis had followings. That is basically the way it worked. And we see that in verse 20. Again, the crowd <clears throat> is so big that Jesus can't even eat a meal. Jesus can't even have time alone to nourish his own body and his disciples with him. And you know, by this time, Jesus has collected the twelve. And we looked at that last time. And the rest are the followers. And the crowd, of course, we know, is pickled by scribes and Pharisees who are trying to discredit him at every turn and every opportunity. Now, this is probably Mary that is concerned about him. His half-brothers and half-sisters were the children of Mary and Joseph. They are concerned about Jesus. And so it tells us in verse 21, when his own people heard, literally a prepositional phrase which says, when those of his, generally referring to a family, when his family heard, they went out to take custody of him. And the verb for custody means to seize. If you will, a kind of a rest or a kind of a rest that to get him away from the threatening crowd. They were convinced he brought it upon himself for they were saying he has lost his senses. What did the family think of Jesus? They thought he was a lunatic. That is not very good thinking. That someone in your own family is a lunatic. I know oftentimes we like to think that our brothers and sisters are lunatics. But this is what his family thought. Did Mary think the same way? Of course not. Mary knew who Jesus was. She knew exactly who he was. The angel told her before he was born. But now his family says he has lost his mind. He is declaring himself to be God. And so they decide the best course of action is to seize him, to arrest him, to get him out of that situation, to rescue him, to rescue him from, because he thinks he's a lunatic and that might cost him his life, or for that matter, to bring further embarrassment on the family. The term berserk, insane, lunatic, you can use any of those words. The actual Greek, he has lost his senses, is a verb to mean to stand outside himself. So in English you can say, we've got this nice saying, he is beside himself. You've all heard that, he is beside Himself, which is a simple way of saying that he is no longer in control. So the conclusion that they come to is that he is a madman. And it is a mad conclusion. And in the meantime, there is another story about the Pharisees. And this is a very important story from 
verses 23 to 30. It's a text that talks about the unforgivable sin. And that is a portion that we will look at next week. But we have to complete the story of Jesus. Verse 31, then his mother and his brothers arrived. Now probably Joseph is not mentioned, so we assume that by this time Joseph had passed away. They came from Nazareth, no doubt, to Capernaum, where Jesus had made his headquarters. And standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. You remember, Jesus is, is inside the house. He is surrounded by a crowd of people. The crowd is so big that it doesn't fit into the house. So the crowd starts gathering outside the house. So obviously, it's easy to find Jesus. Just follow the crowd. And that is what his family does. And because they can't get inside, they send word to him. And then someone says, verse 32, And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Obviously they must have, you know, the message going from ear to ear, Your family is standing outside. Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Verse 33, Jesus answered them and he says, Who are my mother and brothers? Now this is an interesting question. Now you might again think Jesus has gone off his mind asking the question, Who are my mother and my brothers? I mean, this man is 30 years old. He must know by this time who his mother and his brothers are. Jesus is saying something that transcends that kind of consideration. So what he is really saying is who has a genuine relationship to me? Who has a genuine relationship to me? Verse 34, he answers his own question. Looking at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and brothers, all of you who believe in me are my brothers and my sisters and my mother. Which is why we can call Jesus our brother and God our Father. Again, something, a privilege that not even the chosen nation of Israel had the opportunity. The relationship that matters is the relationship of obedience to the will of God. 1 John 3.24 The one who keeps his commandments abide in him. He recycles it again in chapter 5 and he says whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. The story within the story begins in verse 22. When the scribes and the Pharisees come from Jerusalem. And what do they say? They don't even think he is a lunatic. It is way worse than that. They say he is possessed by Beelzebul. He is not just mentally disarranged. He is possessed by Satan. But that is not an explanation for him. That is the explanation they gave. They say he is powered by hell itself. And this is far more sinister, far more devastating. This can be terminal. Jesus says in verse 28, Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. Verse 29, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. 
The eternal sin. What was that? The eternal sin was the conclusion after all the evidence was in that Jesus did not possess the power of God but the power of Satan. You cannot be saved if you come to a conclusion like that. And that is exactly where the rulers of Israel are. And next time we are going to look at the implications of the unforgivable sin and to whom it applies. Some of the light, the sentence of